are going to be recording the meeting unless there are, are any objections so that we can make it available to folks who have let us know they are unable to participate tonight. Um, there will be a series of presentations by technical staff from the Agency of Natural Resources on uh, five different um, components of the work we're engaged in here in the Memphis watershed. And then um, we will hear from some of the, the local watershed and conservation organizations. Uh, and then there will be an opportunity for you all to speak. Um, we will pass around a sign-up sheet. We'll ask anyone who wishes to speak to limit their remarks to two minutes. Um, and we're committed, I know that the agenda suggests a, a 7 p.m. wrap-up time, but we're committed to making sure there's an opportunity for anyone who would like to speak tonight to be able to do such. Um, so this, is, this is the sign-up sheet for public comment. I'm going to start it back here. Please pass it through both sides and then bring it up and we'll go through one by one later in the evening. So, and for those of you participating online, if you want to at, uh, at indicate in the chat um, that you would also like to make a public comment, uh, we will record those as well and alternate between speakers in the room and speakers online in allowing for public comment. I would like to introduce the team from the Agency of Natural Resources that's here with me tonight. Um, first, from our Watershed Management Division and the Department of Environmental Conservation, we have the Division Director, Pete Laflam. And from his team here in the room is Oliver Pearson, who manages our Lakes and Ponds program, and Ben Copans, who's probably a familiar face to most as he's the local basin planner. In addition, Eric Palmer, who's the Fisheries Division Director from the Department of Fish and Wildlife, and one of our fisheries biologists, Pete Emerson, are here on the panel. And then I believe online, uh, we are joined by Rick Levy from the Watershed Management Division, Casey Kathan from the Solid Waste Program, and possibly Amy Pulagic, um, and Nick Giannetti, also from our Wastewater Management Program. I don't know if we've confirmed if they've logged on, Oliver. Not yet. Okay, not yet, but hopefully. <laughs> Nick Giannetti has joined us. Okay. So uh, hopefully we have technical experts that will be able to, to answer questions should you have them, um, and certainly look forward to, to sharing kind of the current available information. Uh, I just want to start by thanking you all for coming out tonight. Uh, part of, you know, one of the biggest challenges at times is, is engaging the public in robust dialogue about the work needed to protect and steward our natural resources. And the, the sheer number of people in the room tonight um, is heartening. I understand that the conversation may be hard or challenging at times, and, but we welcome that. I think the alternative is far worse, where there's no one paying attention, no one who is concerned about ensuring uh, the long-term water quality of a place as beautiful as Lake Memphremagog. So my thanks to you um, for making the time to come this evening. And with that, I will turn it over uh, to Ben. He's going to start with a presentation on the work being done to develop the, the what we call a tactical or watershed basin plan. And Ben, I might, introduce, I might interrupt you once or twice to admit people who are joining late. Okay. But, uh, you can get started with your presentation up there. Thanks, and again, really uh, great to see everyone out here tonight. Um, so my name again is Ben Copans, a watershed planner with the Water Assessment Division. And I'm really just kicking off a tactical basin planning process for the Lake Memphremagog watershed. And so I just wanted to give an introduction to the tactical basin planning process and kind of where we're at. So if you want to go on to the next slide. Can you, can you just ask if the people on teams are, are seeing this? They should be. But yep. Can folks on teams hear this or see this? No. Yeah. No. Just, no. Yeah, so in the state of Vermont, we have broken up the state into 15 tactical basins, and we develop a plan for each one of these basins every five years. Um, and these basins are really our, our guidebook for how we're going to protect and restore our waters in each of these basins. And it, these tactical basin plans serve a lot of functions. They help to implement our federal and state water quality rules. And they're also the vehicle for which we implement our cleanup plans, which we call our total maximum daily loads, or TMDLs. 
And so right now we're just kicking off our, in 2017, we published our last tactical basin plan for the Lake Memphis Magog, Common Colby, and Quad Cook Water Shed. And in 2019, we actually started this cycle with a round of monitoring in the watershed. And then 2019, we did some assessment of all that data. And now we're using all that information to kick off the tactical basin planning process now. And where we're gonna to try to complete this tactical basin plan by 2022. I'm going to go on to the next slide. So most of you know the Lake Memphremagog watershed, which is the, the biggest feature in this basin, which is the Black, Barton, and Clyde Rivers, as well as the Johns River and direct ranges to Lake Memphremagog. But this basin also includes the Tomophobia and Quatico watersheds, which um, make up the Vermont portions of the St. Francis River Basin. <coughs> So I want to say we did we have accomplished a lot since our 2017 plan. So we've um, done a lot of work in our agricultural landscape for the Orleans County Conservation District. They've been implementing lots of best management practices on farms, and we've been able to do some follow-up monitoring to show some phosphorus reductions. The Metro Mega Watershed Association is really taking the lead in developing some designs for stormwater treatment for some of the larger drainages in the uh, city of Newport. And then we've been doing lots of work along our lake shores to do lake shore restoration projects. Again, in coordination with a lot of our um, lake associations and with the Northwood Stewardship Center really leading the way in terms of implementing those projects. And then also a, a, a pretty significant effort with the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department to start up our riparian lands restoration effort along some of the, the streams in the watershed. But we know there's a lot of work to do. And so this tactical basin plan is really going to focus on um, continuing to implement the phosphorus cleanup plan for Lake Memphis Magog. You know, continuing to work with farms, roads, developed lands. We're going to be um, trying, working to address several agricultural impaired streams and ponds in the watershed. Also looking at some of the increasing nutrient trends we see in some of our ponds up in the watershed and continuing to work to restore you know, aquatic habitat to support our fisheries and address flood resilience in our watershed communities. And many of those things also work to help in terms of implementing the, the cleanup plan for, for Lake Newfoundland. And finally, communicating the monitoring plans and outcomes related to the brown bullhead, as well as um, the, the sampling efforts of uh, PFOS um, which we're going to talk about later today. And so I do want to just make the point that our tactical basin plans really deal with community-based efforts to address those issues. We have existing permit programs that are really the process by which individual permits are led, and that's not really the focus of our tactical basin plan. There's public processes associated with each of those that's independent from the, the tactical basin planning process. So in terms of next steps, um, Right now, we're gonna be putting out a public survey over the next two months to get some public input on community concerns and information. We're collecting all the data internally. We're updating a report card on all the things we've accomplished from our last tactical basin plan. And then we're gonna to start to engage the community in some community discussions and meetings around agricultural issues and all of these topics which come up through the tactical basin planning process. And then we have internal and external review periods uh, with the goal of getting the final plan in place by the end of uh, 2022. And so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Oliver to talk a little bit more about some of the efforts that I'm like. Oliver's doing that. I'll just jump back in briefly. Um, I, I failed in, in my initial remarks to acknowledge our, our important collaboration and partners um, in both the Quebec Ministry of the Environment as well as sorry, the Co Co Joseph um, St. Francis Watershed Organization and believe that Julie um, Renier is, is on the line tonight um, and will also be speaking in part to some of the shared sampling work we're doing. Um, but there's also, a, as many of you I'm sure know it, an international or a joint international steering committee um, composed of representatives from Vermont and the province of Quebec that really guides our overall water quality work and is integral in some of the phosphorus reduction efforts. So with that, I'll turn it over to Oliver. 
Great, thanks, Secretary Moore. Good evening, my name is Oliver Pearson. I, I manage the Lakes and Ponds program for Vermont DC, and in five minutes or less, I'm gonna to try to talk about what we're doing, building on what Ben just presented on, on um, reducing phosphorus loads uh, to Lake Mimpermega from the watershed, and also the monitoring. Um, and so, you know, prior to a couple of years ago, before the lesions were first detected on the brown bullhead, and, and, and excuse me, PFAS was detected in, in Sherbrooke, Phosphorus was the Agency of Natural Resources, one of our principal focuses in Lake Memphremagog in terms of water quality, along with, with aquatic invasive species prevention issues. So I know there's other topics that we're, we're talking about here tonight, but from my perspective, keeping our attention on reducing phosphorus loads and trying to take this, what is now considered an impaired lake, and restore it to where it meets Vermont's water quality standards should remain one of the state's and the local community's principal priorities for, for Memphremega. Um, go ahead, Ben. Yes, okay. So just some, some background on this, and I'm gonna stand here so I can read what I wrote. Um, Memphremega is an interesting international water body with 73% of its surface area in Quebec, but around 71% of its watershed in Vermont. So what happens in Vermont uh, influences a lake which is binational, but three quarters of which is in, in Quebec. So as I mentioned, the Vermont portion of the lake is considered impaired. It doesn't meet our standard for this type of water body, 14 parts per billion of phosphorus. Um, so in September of 2017, the state put forth a phosphorus total maximum daily load or phosphorus reduction plan to address the sources of phosphorus impairment and restore the lake. The Quebec portion of the lake does meet applicable provincial standards but through the Quebec-Vermont Steering Committee, which is a joint group of actors on both sides of the border, we've worked very closely on both modeling what we need to reduce phosphorus loads to the base and both sides to the lake, excuse me, both sides of the watershed, and uh, implement projects and share information. So that's a group that meets at least twice a year, sometimes more regularly, to share information and coordinate activities. So just the big picture is, you know, over the last five years, Vermont state agencies have spent almost $7 million to, to uh, clean water projects in the Memphremagog Basin. Uh, what has that gotten us? That's gotten us about a four metric ton reduction in phosphorus loads to the lake, primarily from agriculture projects. One, because we have recommended, or excuse me, required agricultural practices in place where we can estimate the, the amount of phosphorus load reduction from those practices. And that's also one of the principal forms of land use in the watershed. We're also trying to reduce phosphorus loads from other land use types, be it roads, be it shoreland properties, as Ben mentioned. And as we come up with the modeling um, coefficients to estimate the load reduction from those types of interventions, that figure will, will only increase. Go ahead, Ben. So this is sort of a busy slide. I'll just put in a few things. This is our lake scorecard for Lake Memphis Magog. And what it shows, there's a few sort of key takeaways, is, is one, we have a very stable total phosphorus concentration going back you know, to 1984. You, you see it sort of hovering around 15 to 20 parts per billion. Today it's at about 19, and the target in the TMDL, as I said, is, is 14. So this is a large system, it's a large lake. All these great interventions we're doing in the watershed are gonna take time to show an impact in terms of the lake's total phosphorus concentration. So right now that's, that's stable, and that's more or less backed up when we go out in the spring less regularly uh, to, to collect that data. I believe uh, Chuck Golding is here. He's the current lay monitor who goes out at least eight times during the summer to collect this data. So thanks very much to him for, for that support. The other thing this shows is we have a deteriorating water clarity trend. So what, going back to 1984 to today, the lake is getting slightly less clear. It's, it's a pretty small trend, but it's statistically significant. And so we have some theories on why that's happening as part of our overall water quality efforts to track that and try to turn that trend around. So this is the lake scorecard. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna leave it at that. There's, there's a lot of other great information in here. I'd be happy to talk to folks more about this after the meeting. So really the, the big picture, you know, we have the stable total phosphorus as well as chlorophyll A, which is a measure of biological productivity, trends in the lake, and then our second year, our water clarity trend is, is deteriorating. 2020, we had a relatively normal, um, phosphorus concentration in the lake after two years of above average concentrations, probably related to both reduced precipitation in 2020 and, and good land use management practices. We have a bit of a ways to go for the main lake to meet our to meet our target. And one of the indicators that folks always ask about for water quality is how are we doing on blue green algae or cyanobacteria blooms? 2020 was a quiet year. There was only one high alert bloom. We've, we've had two reported high alert blooms this, this summer so far. 
through the cyanobacteria tracker. One was August 20th, so we did just have a bloom on the lake two days ago. But this, the trend we're seeing so far this summer is below what we saw prior to 2020. Hopefully that's a sign that we're, we're beginning to turn the corner on some of our water quality efforts. South Bay is a bit of a different story. We, we have already, we're already at the, the targeted total phosphorus concentration for South Bay, so that's the good news. Uh, but there are some deteriorating water quality and nutrient response conditions in, in South Bay as well, so we're keeping an eye on, on those. Go ahead, Ben. So yeah, this just shows our, our, tar our, our TMDL targets. For the future, we want to continue our, our, our in-lake monitoring efforts. I think the exciting thing here is we're trying to train more cyanobacteria monitors and more Vermont invasive species monitors so we get better information. So if anyone's interested in doing that, also see me after the meeting. But we want more data, we want more information from the public to help us better understand what's happening in the lake. And finally, folks may have read about there's a new Mephromega monitoring observatory in Quebec. They're putting out high frequency monitoring buoys in the lake on the Quebec side of the border to get real time data collected every 15 minutes or so. And we just are beginning to think about can we do that on the Vermont side of the border as well. That costs money, so we need to see if we can, we can find that funding source. Um, and then last point. This is something that Ben and the, the um, Natural Resource Conservation District for Orleans County are more involved in, but we're also doing tributary monitoring, principally for phosphorus, to see what's coming into the bay. And we want to eventually do some modeling to estimate loads, and that'll help us understand which of the catchments might be the bigger sources of phosphorus, and we can focus our uh, land, land use management and phosphorus reduction uh, best management practices on those areas. So, I think I'll leave it at that. In the interest of time, the, the, the tributary sampling is around on five rivers on the Vermont side of the border, and there's some similar efforts happening in Quebec as well. So Ben, I think that's all we have. Uh, thanks, everyone, for your attention, and we'll move along with the agenda. Um, so should I introduce the next speaker? Please. So um, Pete Emerson from the Department of Fish and Wildlife will be speaking about um, the malignant melanomas in the Brown Bulldog. Pete Emerson, I'm a fish biologist out of the St. John's Bird District. Um, myself and Judd Kratz are our managers for the water pretty much for the Northeast Kingdom and a little further south into uh, the Wells River drainage. So um, clearly we have been involved uh, with the brown ball ballhead melanoma, which has been observed in Lake Mpermagog since 2012, when we were first uh, receiving reports from Angus along the way in South Bay, particularly. Uh, the brown bullhead melanoma have been observed all the way up into Quebec. We've seen them in the city of Magog on the beach, um, and we've seen them all through South Bay and the rivers. Is that better? Well, that's rare that I'm asked to be louder. So, that's <laughs> so first reports of brown, brown bullhead melanoma in the late 2012. Uh, the Department of Fish and Wildlife does annual sampling at multiple sites across the lake. Uh, South Bay, Hospital Cove, some of you know that as Scott's Cove, um, and at the Twins, um, where we do bass sampling around the islands closer to the border. So we have a good sense of, of what the, the fishery is here in Vermont, and we partner with um, the, our, our partners in fisheries in Quebec uh, with the ministry. And they're finding the same thing. We're seeing uh, brown bullhead all the way up the lake with uh, melanoma. In 2013 and 2014, we started paying attention to the bullhead uh, proportions. We started looking at individual fish as we handled them. We've handled several thousand fish. Um, and we're looking at uh, proportions that vary from year to year, but generally are running at about 30% of the fish that we handle uh, do have the melanoma showing on them. So it was uh, pretty disturbing for us. In 2015, we went out to uh, partners with the US Geological Survey um, at the Leestown Science Center um, and brought some, some real pros in to look closer at the lesions. They were the ones that confirmed it was melanoma. And we've been partnering with them ever since. Um, we were curious if we could solve this by looking at the uh, some of the contaminant history that we might have a sense of what might be existing here in the lake. So we collected a lot of fish of three species from Lake Mpromega. We were looking at yellow perch, we were looking at bass, and we were looking at the bullhead. 
and we were looking at 60 different analytes that were recommended in a standard EPA practice when you look at fish with uh, contaminant concerns. Following that investigation, which took place in 2017 and 2018, and was paired with uh, sediment samples and water quality samples, looking at those same analytes, um, we did not find anything that was a smoking gun. We didn't look at anything that made us feel that we need to um, uh, put consumption advisories out there. The bullhead did not appear to be suffering from high doses of any of the contaminants that we were concerned with. But that didn't solve the problem. We still have fish with melanoma tumors in the lake. And as a fish biologist, I'm very interested in solving that problem and seeing if we can do something to help the fish, or at least know what it is that the fish are suffering from. So this year, uh, we have made a proposal using some partnerships with the UVM Medical Center and some folks that are very well versed in genetics research for cancer, uh, along with our partners at the USGS, uh, Vicki Blazer, who uh, reported the melanoma in the first place, and we are now waiting to receive funding so that we can do a much broader uh, investigation looking not simply at contaminants, but at the whole spectrum of problems that might be uh, leading to these melanoma. So a much more thorough study, a much more in-depth study, and likely to take a little more time. So that is all I have to report for now, but I'll take questions later. Thank you very much. Oh yeah. So Rick is next. And Rick is not here. Yes, sir. He's going to be on. Rick is going to be on, on the big screen. Uh, up next is Rick Levy from the Department of Environmental, Environmental Conservation, and Rick has been helping a lot with this bullhead melanoma in addition to a lot of other things which you'll hear about now. So, Rick, do you want to share your screen, or would you like me to put your uh, oh. presentation on? Oh. Hi, Oliver. I'll, uh, I'll share. We'll see if that works. That way, I could uh, I could toggle around. Great. Is that is it showing up? Not yet, but uh, now it's, we got you. We have to see the boat. <laughs> ah. Beautiful. Yeah, that's just uh, something for uh, everybody to look at while they listen a little bit about uh, some of the PFAS monitoring that, that we're doing. So could everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Welcome. Uh, it's nice to be uh, sharing some of our results with uh, with all the interested stakeholders here today. So, uh, Vermont DEC Watershed Management Division, in cooperation with the Department of Fish and Wildlife, initiated a multi-year monitoring project in 2021 to monitor for the presence of PFOS compounds in fish tissue and surface waters in lakes and rivers throughout the month. So these sampling efforts uh, will help develop a baseline of PFOS contamination within the state and help identify action areas and provide the necessary data for appropriate response. The Lake Member Magog comprehensive PFOS surface water and fish tissue sampling is part of the statewide monitoring effort. On July 20th uh, of this year, Vermont DEC conducted the first three sampling events to assess PFOS concentrations in surface waters and fish tissue in Lake Mimpermega and the major tributaries uh, on the Vermont side. Surface water samples from 10 sites within the watershed uh, Well, surface water samples from 10 sites within the watershed uh, were collected and sent to uh, a U.S. laboratory for analysis of 36 PFOS, including the five regulated PFOS in Vermont. When uh, we're sampling for PFOS, the detection limits are down in the single part per trillion. So, uh, PFOS is very ubiquitous. It's in the environment, it's in uh, sunscreens, it's in clothing, uh, it's in atmospheric deposition. 
So uh, the quality control that's needed when collecting these samples is very high. Uh, we use a stainless steel dipper and collect the samples from uh, approximately a foot uh, below the surface. The sites that were sampled uh, in Lake Pepermagog were uh, three sites on the main lake, uh, one up by the U.S.-Canada border, and we also uh, partnered and collaborated with uh, Julie Grenier and her team with COJEF, and part of this uh, sampling uh, collaboration was to split duplicate samples in half of our U.S. laboratory and then their Canadian laboratory do the analysis for the PFOS to basically do inter-laboratory comparisons and quality control to see if we can share data back and forth. So the, the three main lake sites were uh, the U.S.-Canada border where duplicate samples were shared, a mid-lake station uh, number two, uh, station number three, a southern lake station, and then the Johns River was the northernmost tributary. And then at the lower part of the map, uh, where it gets a little busy, we had two sites on the Clyde River, one at the mouth and one above the Newport Wastewater Treatment Facility. Then we had a site, uh, two sites on the Black River, one uh, at the mouth and one further upstream above the Coventry landfill, and another one on the Barton River, as well as a site on South Bay. So that was fairly comprehensive sites for the Vermont side. Uh, Julie's team uh, sampled, uh, I know at least three sites shown here in this map. The sites that we shared duplicate samples were the, uh, the US Canada Main Lake site, as well as we also sampled the Newport uh, Wastewater Treatment Facility effluent. The preliminary results are uh, out in a report. Uh, this is one sampling event of, of three on Lake Pembermagog. The second one, uh, the first one was on July 20th. The second sampling event was on August 20th. The, the last one will be uh, in the middle of September. And we also collected uh, fish tissue samples from four sites, two on the main lake, one on the Clyde River, and one uh, in South Bay. The good news is uh, of the 36 PFAS that we analyzed for in uh, at the U.S. lab, there were only detections of two PFAS, one at the Mid Lake Site 2 site, uh, Mid Lake site, for PFOS at a concentration of 2.8 parts per trillion, and then one at the mouth of the Johns River for PFPA at just above two parts per trillion. These are very low concentrations, and they're actually concentrations consistent with what you would find even in very remote uh, areas around the world because of uh, atmospheric deposition. Uh, many of these are, uh, are very ubiquitous. The uh, results from the effluent at the Newport uh, Wastewater Facility were also very low. Uh, in fact, for the carb regulated Vermont PFOS, uh, it, the sum of the five was only 22 parts per trillion. The report includes uh, interlaboratory comparisons, our quality control uh, that was done with duplicate samples, field samples, equipment blank blanks, as well as uh, other laboratory quality controls were uh, all looking very, uh, very excellent. And we're really pleased with the, this first round of sampling results back uh, for this PFOS sampling in Lake Pemper Bay. Uh, again, I see I'm over, so I'll, uh, I'll, I'll be around for questions uh, at the end of the presentations. Thank you. Thanks, Rick. Thanks, Rick. And um, just, just a quick reminder for folks that are joining us on Teams, um, if you would like to sign up to make a comment, please do so in the chat. Just indicate that you'd like to make a comment.
comment when we do get to that portion of the meeting. And for folks, uh, I'm Keith LaFlam. I'm director of the Watershed Management Division at Vermont DEC. Uh, several of the folks here tonight are also working within the division, the Lakes and Ponds Program, uh, Rick in the Monitoring and Assessment um, Program, and then I'm here um, to talk a little bit about the pretreatment permit and a little bit about the timeline for that. As you all realize, the pretreatment permit is not yet out on draft, but I wanted to talk about the process. So folks are aware generally that the Coventry Landfill has applied for a pretreatment permit. So this is a permit, this is a federal permit that in Vermont we're a delegated authority, so we manage the federal and PDES or the federal permitting program for both direct discharges, like from the Newport Wastewater Treatment Facility, but also pretreatment discharges that go into those facilities. Certain different industrial uh, types require those pretreatment permits. The landfill is one of those. So we had hoped to have that permit out by the time this meeting occurred. Right now our schedule is mid-September. We will have that permit out, and the process will be we'll release that permit on a 30-day public notice period. So we'll put it out on public notice, we'll notify folks um, that that permit is out, it will be out for 30 days, during which time we'll do two things. We'll accept written public comment during that 30-day period, and we'll also have a public meeting, similar to this meeting, up here in Newport, where we'll welcome folks in to make comments specific to that pretreatment permit. We're still working on some of the details of that permit internally, but I can tell you a few of the details tonight that we are really three different areas that we're focusing on in that permit that will help provide some context for the permit when it does come out on draft. First of all, and probably of greatest interest, um, is the, the permit authorizes, it requires treatment of the leachate, and then it also, secondly and differently, authorizes delivery of that leachate to certain wastewater treatment facilities. We're gonna continue the moratorium on discharging of that leachate to the Newport facility. The Newport facility, the Newport wastewater treatment facility will not be on that list of approved facilities to receive leachate as a result of the pre-treatment permit. So that will be one important leg, but really what we're focusing on with the pre-treatment permit is treatment. And so we are requiring that Casella develop within the first four months a plan to pilot technology to remove PFOSs from the leachate and to submit that plan to us for review. We've set a standard in that permit by which they need to, they'll need to devise the pilot uh, program to meet um, and we're gonna collect a bunch of data about that. We'll approve the pilot plan after reviewing it and potentially modifying it. That pilot will then be put in place and we wanna see that system operate for at least two full seasons. There'll be a requirement by the third year that they produce a report, a comprehensive report on the efficacy of the removals across different seasons, working in real time at, um, at treating the leachate, and then also looking at the economics of that, looking at all different factors associated with the, um, with the treatment of that leachate. And then really the third major leg of that pretreatment permit is gonna be monitoring. It's gonna be characterizing the nature of the effluent and then also the removal efficiencies of the effluent as it passes through approved wastewater treatment facilities and discharges um, out of those approved wastewater treatment facilities for some of the more conventional pollutants. So really those are the three key elements that you'll see in that in much more detail, <laughs> in quite a bit of detail um, as that pretreatment permit comes out for public comment and review. But I wanted to at least give you tonight that sort of preview um, as to what to be looking for if you look for those three different elements. So again, the, the continuation of the moratorium here in Newport, um, the pilot study and all of the different requirements around that pilot study, and then thirdly, the monitoring and characterization of the effluent, the efficacy of wastewater treatment, um, <clears throat> for that effluent and then downstream receiving water monitor. So that's, that's the process and the rough timeline on what we're doing with the pretreatment permit. And again, we're gonna open this up for comments at the end, questions at the end, and happy to talk more about that at that time. But now in the agenda, 
we have an opportunity for um, three different watershed associations that would like to um, talk, provide a statement. And Oliver, who's up first? I believe it's, uh, I think the Don't Undermine Metro Magog's Purity is up first. All right, so yes. Dump is up first. And please come up. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Sure. Secretary Moore for sponsoring this community forum and listening to our shared concerns for the future of Lake Member Magog. My name is Henry Cove, and I am a member of a voluntary citizens environmental group, Dump, Don't Undermine Member Magog's Purity, whose members include many Quebec neighbors and allies unable to cross the border and to attend in person. The words may be mine, but the ideas are from your neighbors. Among these, we are honored with it that Robert Benoit, Robert Benoit, president of Member Magog Conservation Incorporated, will share in this program. Robert is a founding member of DUMP and has collaborated with us for three years in fighting for protections of our shared international lake. We welcome Vermonters and Quebecers alike who care and are concerned about the environmental threats to Lake Member Magog. We thank the ANR secretary and for their and the staff for your interest. Newport is the Geneva of North America. I was fortunate 50 years ago to hear these words spoken to the Newport City Council by a European American, Hans Plunder, who had come to Newport as a city planning specialist. I have never been to Switzerland, but I have remembered the image he described of two cities taking advantage of their parallel natural settings on their respective international lakes. At the end of a most interesting evening, Dr. Charles Sherman, Jr., mayor of Newport, quietly said, perhaps it is time we turn our city around and begin to face the lake. This building is a testament. <clears throat> much has happened over the years. Much that is positive continues to happen. Our challenge today is to ask, what will Lake Infermagog be in another 50 years? Unfortunately, the most important stakeholders to the future of our lake are not here tonight or today. They are our grandchildren and their grandchildren. We must think of them. Um, just as an aside, and this isn't part of my prepared remarks, uh, we were heartened to hear that the moratorium will be extended. This was news to us out of the Canadian press this morning. And, uh, and we did not come today to, de to debate the pilot project that uh, Mr. Peter Laflamme has just introduced. That will come later and we intend to be present. What brings us here today? The Vermont Agency of Natural Resources labeled Lake, Lake Metro Magog is impaired and degraded. Although the ANR secretary choose not to designate Member Magog as a lake in crisis, as petitioned by 3,900 citizens, we are appreciative in that she and her staff have come to Newport prepared to discuss and implement the dumper initiated response plan and other actions. Uh, I should read what Peggy Stevens, a dump member, wrote in the Chronicle last week. Quote, the purpose of the lake in crisis petition was to bring attention and resources to protect the lake and to defend it against environmental contamination, evident in the cancerous brown bullhead found in the lake and nowhere else in Vermont. There is no disputing the risk to the environment, the public health, or our local economy posed by sick fish, blue-green algae blooms, and measurable levels of toxic PFAS chemicals found recently in Sherbrooke's drinking water supply earlier this year. The ANR has begun testing fish and water for PFAS Thank you, that's a good start. More must be done to develop a plan to protect the lake. The sources of the contaminants causing these serious problems must be pinpointed and effectively dealt with to prevent future damage to water quality. Households, commercial businesses, and industry all contribute hundreds of harmful chemicals, as does landfill leachate. Lake Minfer Magog is distinct from all other Vermont lakes. In fact, it serves as a drinking water source for 175,000 Canadians. You know, many students at Lake Region and even in North Country don't know this fact. In fact, 
25 to 40 percent of brown bullhead fish in South Bay and Hospital Cove present with malignant tumors, I'm sorry, cancers on the flesh and in their organs. This is extremely rare and is linked to contaminated waters, which is a quote from Dr. Blazer of USGS. Fact, it is home to Vermont's only remaining and permitted private landfill. Most of Vermont's waste ends up in Coventry. An increasing proportion, over 20%, comes from out of state. The landfill produces the equivalent of five to six semi-tanker truck loads per day of toxic leachate, otherwise known as garbage use. Over a 10-year period, between 36 million and 40 million gallons of toxic leachate were delivered to the Newport Wastewater Treatment Plant. And it's our understanding that such municipal plants are designed to treat domestic sewage, not remove toxic chemicals such as PFAS. The contaminated treatment plant, F1, was dumped into the Clyde River a short distance from the lake. That's uh, 36, to 36 to 40 million tons in a nine year period. A&R and Casella maintain that it cannot be proved that toxic landfill leachate is the cause of sick fish. But we ask, can it be proven not to be the cause in the, abs in the absence of adequate studies? The short answer is no. Eve Crumden, writing in Waste Dive Magazine in 2020, states that landfill leachate, quote, is an exposure pathway for high concentrations of PFAS, which are harmful to the environment and bioaccumulated biota and in the food chain. In Dump's view, filtration and treatment options for PAFS PFAS and other chemicals are too important to society to be left to the private waste industry. I'll repeat that. This is a fundamental principle in which we believe. In Dump's view, filtration and treatment options for PFAS and other chemicals are too important to society to be left to the private waste industry alone. Three years ago, area citizens. <laughs> Three years ago, area citizens in written comments overwhelmingly opposed the 51-acre landfill expansion and formed Duff. When learning of PFAS concentrations nearly six times over the Vermont safe standard for drinking water in a groundwater sample well between the landfill and the Black River, Duff acted to appeal the ANR decision to permit the expansion. While the Environmental Court and the Act 254 did uphold the permit to expand, they did so with important conditions among them that a moratorium or ban was placed on treatment of landfill leachate anywhere in the Mimpermagog watershed. The mediation states no leachate treatment at the Newport plant for four years or until January 1, 2024. We're glad tonight that uh, it, the agency has seen fit to, to extend that moratorium. In Dump's view, this is an environmental accident waiting to happen. Factors to consider included, include liner linkage to groundwater, stormwater runoff from Vermont's largest continuous impermeable surface, 129 acres, as well as uncaptured methane releases to the atmosphere. The, the Casella company has a history of operation and management violations, the latest being the 154,000 gallon leachate spill at their nearby Bethlehem, New Hampshire landmark, <laughs> spilling toxins into the Amanusik River. A similar spill in Coventry would be an international environmental disaster. We respectfully call on a &R to end Vermont's dependence on a single landfill, distant from population centers. There are alternative sites. The time has come for the state to revive its mandate to develop a comprehensive solid waste plan based on zero waste principles and on regional depositories closer to Vermont's population centers. Do not grant automatic 10-year renewal permits. Let 2018 be the last expansion of the Coventry landfill. Augment liability and guarantees and bonds in event of accidents and the final closure. Treatment of landfill leachate is too important a public function to allow it to be planned and run by a private for-profit corporation. The Northeast Kingdom, already Vermont's sacrifice zone, is becoming known as Vermont's and New England's dumping ground. Let the rest of Vermont share the burden. 
Let the leachate must be treated elsewhere. No leachate ever in the Mimpermagog watershed. This is our prime objective. It is the Canadians' prime objective. We ask you to listen. You've been patient. Just a few closing, more philosophical remarks. In our monthly meetings of dump volunteers, we have discussed some abiding and positive guidelines. One, the precautionary principle. This principle is enshrined in law in many nations, but not, in, not so in the US. It says that when scientific evidence is uncertain about an environmental or human health hazard, then no action should be taken until it is demonstrated there is no harmful impact. Two, act as a respectful neighbor. With three quarters of the northerly four in Mimpermagog watershed in Vermont, yet 80% of the lake's geography in Canada, we have a high obligation to our northern neighbors to care for this fragile, most important resource. To allow northerly flowing waters to be polluted by Vermont actions and inaction is just, it's not just unneighborly, it is irresponsible, it is immoral. The need to three, the need to protect the lake in order to improve the lake. We must first do no harm to our surface and groundwater resources. Clean water is life. Do everything to protect it. Apathy is the friend of environmental injustice. Four, no treatment of landfill leachate in the Magog watershed ever. Five. Five, cherish this lake. Three words imprinted in granite on a bench facing the lake in Pomerleau Park, just 300, mile, uh, 300 yards from here. Have you sat on it to contemplate the lake's beauty? In the words of former Newport Mayor Charlie Prado, quote, hold this lake dear, be, thank be thankful that we have such a wonderful resource in our area, and fight as you would for a loved one, never to do anything to harm it. Mimpermagog is the lifeblood of our border area. We should always treat it as such. I'll, I'll end by just saying, we encourage all to keep these guidelines in mind as we work to protect and improve our lake for future generations. Thank you, and I'll turn the program over to our colleagues. Thank you, Dr. Hall. Robert, uh, yes. tu, tu peux commencer, on, on vous entend très bien. Allez-y. Français. Donc, mais pour plus clairement, I wish I was in Newport. Good day, Secretary Moore. And thank you for this opportunity to present a perspective as Canadian citizen who shared this international lake with you. Also, a special thank to Mr. Peter Laflamme, a real gentleman like Henri Cole. My name is Robert Benoit, and I'm here today representing Memphremiga Conservation, Inc. As you know, we in Quebec have every reason to be very concerned about contamination of our lake and the need to protect the lake now and in the future. The fact that 175,000 Quebecers region get their drinking water from the lake raise or concern about toxic contamination to the highest level. Any contaminant entering the lake in the U.S. watershed may end up in the Sherbrooke Mega water supply. I don't mean to say, Mr. Secretary Moore, that not only it is morally wrong for individuals to pollute, to pollute a good neighbor, but it is wrong for a group of people to allow, to allow it to happen. A drop of water from Newport will leach it for country, will travel north for two years in the lake before reaching Migron River. Any chemical contaminant in that drop of water will make quite damage all along the journey of 700 days. The damage to the fish, damage to the water, damage to the sediment, damage to the beach, damage to the ecosystem, and at the end of the journey, damage to the health of 175 Canadians who drink that water. One look at a cancerous bullhead fish tells us something is terribly wrong 
in Black River and in the lake. The cause of this cancer has been tied to environmental contamination by Madame Dr. Glazer, who conducted a fantastic study, and by other researchers. As a, as a citizen, what do you do when you read in the morning paper that PFA, PFAS was discovered in Sherbrooke and Mega, drinking water, drinking water earlier this year at 13 parts per trillion, while leading scientists agree that the surface highest limit is one part per trillion. Research shows without a doubt that leaching even a small amount contaminate ground and surface water. Some would like to blame Quebec for PFAS present on Lake Memphremiga. This is simply not the case. For example, wastewater treatment plant in Quebec contribute for only one third of the daily discharge in the lake. The rest come from the, the Fort Water water treatment plant in the U.S. processing over 2 million gallons of wastewater every day. In Quebec, only residential, small commercial, and very small industrial wastewater discharge enter this plant. We in Quebec closed our garbage dump in, 19, in 2010. The landfill leachate entered the land from Quebec site of the burger did enter the, the lake from the Quebec sites since 1997. Thanks to Edward Cohen's team of town, we were successful in getting a moratorium on the discharge of leachate from wastewater treatment plant in Lake Memphremega with the Casella company until 2023. The treatment will not disappear after that day. Thank you, thank you to postpone the, to the moratorium 2000, 2026. And I'm sure we will have another meeting in 2026 about that matter. No leachate should be treated or disposed into Lake Memphremega or anywhere in its watershed ever again. Why? Because of the bio accumulation. It's a quiet monster. It starts slowly and go from bad to worse in your body. And when you get sick, my friend, it is too late. You may try to sue the company or try to sue the wastewater the wet the was the wastewater treatment plant or your municipality. I wish you good luck in your battle. Because nobody, nobody will be held account accountable for killing you slowly with this chemical. Remember the DDT, the tobacco industry, the Popal disaster in India, 2003, people died. The Flint water crisis in the United States, the Walterton tragedy, tragedy in Canada, and I can go on and on all day. Let's hope that the precautionary principle had a place on a so-called evolved society. In 1909, the Pottery Water Treaty was signed between our two countries, prohibiting either one from con contaminating the water of the other. Canada and the United States mutually agreed not to pollute water if it could hurt people or property on the other country. That agreement is still in place and must be honored here and now. In the law of the land in Canada, polluter and pollution have no acquired right. Talking about the law of the land, Mr. Secretary Moore, you mentioned in Burlington TV station recently that the decision of Coventry would be made in the United States by America. Of course, we Canadians respect that. But I'd like to remind you of three important actions were taken by a different level of government in the last few months, and great number of these politicians are on the line at this point. The first one, from the working table of elected representatives from the federal, the provincial, the regional, and municipal government, 
It's quite a job to get all of them sitting on one table. A statement was sent to you, Mrs. Moore. We say no issue should be traded on spot into Memphis Mega or anywhere in its watershed ever again. The second one was the letters from Benoit Charret, Quebec Minister of Environnement. A letter sent to you asking the moratorium on the treatment of issue be continued. The last one, but not the least, not the least. The National Assembly of Quebec of June the 3rd, a motion was adopted unanimously by the Prime Minister, all the ministers, and all the hundred and elected, elected members at the effect that no nation should be driven or disposed to Memphis and God or anywhere in its watershed again. Water is life and cannot be replaced. All voice must be heard, Mrs. Secretary Moore and Governor Scott. I will be closing by saying we know your job, Mrs. Moore, is not and will not be easy in the coming weeks and months. Stop between the state of Vermont and Quebec, between Casella and Coventry, between Newport City and the lake, and the lake, between the leach and the lake and the health of the citizens. But as John F. Kennedy said in September 1962, we do these things not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Mr. Secretary Moore, we Canadians press you and you to and hope you make the best call for all party. We at NCI respect the people who were here before us. We listen to the leaders who are there now. And we dream of the people who will be there after us. Mr. Secretary Moore, friend, neighbor, thank you very much. Et merci. Thank you, Robert. Uh, next, I'd like to invite forward a, a representative of the Memphis Watershed Association to also offer some remarks. My name is Stan Schaub. I'm on the board of the Nefmega Water Search Association. Um, first of all, we'd like to thank the state of Vermont for uh, holding this event. Uh, we uh, appreciate the state's uh, research concerning that Nefmega, and NWA intends to continue assisting in these endeavors as we can. Uh, NWA also likes to thank all the partners with whom we've had the privilege of working. Uh, these partners include the federal, the state, the uh, uh, local governments, international partners, nonprofits, businesses, and other lake associations. Without these partnerships, much needed work could not have proceeded in the last few years. And without these partnerships, uh, without these collaborations, uh, we well, with this collaboration, we can ensure the, the the uh, sustainability of our local government environment and current and future generations of the U.S. and Canadian residents living in the Memphis Lake Dog watershed. Like everyone else here, NWA is interested in issues that impact the lake. However, however we also have been addressing issues in the watershed as a whole for the past 14 years. Could we uh, share the next slide? Um, NWA's work is made possible by an active board of directors and I'm actually totally amazed all the time at how much work we get done with just volunteers. Um, we occasionally, from time to time, have funding from grants that we do have paid staff, but for the most part it is a passionate group of volunteers. Uh, we're funded through memberships, donations, and grants. Our vision is a future where the Lake Memphis Magog watershed is ecologically healthy and communities are engaged in resource stewardship for the protection, resiliency, and enjoyment of this significantly large drainage area. To accomplish this goal, MWA has uh, worked on five strategic plans. First one being uh, sterile restoration. 
we just finished a, a big one that we worked on with the city of Newport, look right here across the way in uh, Prouty Beach. Uh, actually, we've been working with the Shoreline Protection for many years with Prouty, but recently we were able to uh, sponsor the, uh, the installation of a pollination garden and also a rain garden, uh, along with the, uh, the uh, new bike trail. It's, it's really very impressive. Um, we also have the lakewide assessments that we work with. That's where we have a member that's trained in lakewise uh, assessing and works with local uh, shoreline residents and those folks that want to improve their and restore their shoreline with vegetation, the proper vegetation. So those are two programs we have going on that we work with. Could we um, have a next slide, please? Stormwater mitigation. We've got two really huge projects going on, as far as I'm concerned, as far as being uh, arranged with volunteers. Um, and that's mitigation right here, actually right up the road here a little bit, where we have uh, about 107 acres of water draining down into the lake into a small area and uh, you know bringing the silt down with it and anyway, we've got a we just finished the design project for that area and also another design project where we have a lot of silt coming into the lake right over here by the marina uh, so i think our next stage in that is the implement implementation but uh, i'm really proud of what what our organization has done in that respect we also have some smaller uh, projects going on where we have rain gardens that we've uh, actually restored along the Clyde River. Uh, we were working in the, the uh, farmer's market selling rain barrels, and uh, we have other areas where we've been doing some buffer planting. Let's see here. I think we're ready for the next slide. Aquatic invasive species. We have different, uh, as you can see here, uh, different uh, parts of our organization that are working with invasive species. We are actually working with uh, MCI right now, the, the Canadian side, with uh, monitoring the zebra mussels. Where we have 20 traps along some of our uh, um, docks, along with what they're doing on their, their side to uh, monitor how the zebra mussels are moving in. Um, we also work, one of our members is working with uh, the state in regards to milfoil. Uh, reduction at the uh, both side, not both side, but the uh, uh, I can't think of what the name is right now. Anyhow, uh, in Newport Town, they're working with Newport Town. I can't, I can't think of right now. It's up by the uh, Strawberry Acres. Acres. Yeah. Strawberry Acres, right? Um, yeah. And let's see, we have patrollers looking for uh, any invasives that might be coming into the lake, reporting to the state. And uh, we just had a huge <laughs> party, so to speak, uh, with eradicating uh, Frank Nottie's right over here by the uh, Prouty Beach. There was about 100 feet that, uh, and that was another collaboration with the Columbia Forest Products. We had uh, the Land Trust. We had uh, Northwood Stewardship also working there with us um, to clear out as best we can manage the 100, uh, 100 feet of frag mines. Let's see. Riparian and wetland restoration, very excited about this too. Uh, just with this last year, we were able to uh, get grants so that we could uh, hire a project manager. And he's been doing a fantastic job this last month walking along the Johns River, uh, mapping the Johns River, identifying where there needs to be restoration, other areas where it's looking okay. But he's working with uh, he's working on lands that belong to the state, uh, the access, and of course private landowners too. So we're really happy uh, about how much he's been able to do in the last few months, and working basically with Pete from our fisheries and wildlife department. Okay, I think we're ready for the next slide. Uh, education and events. We really worked hard with young people. You know, Henry mentioned uh, in his presentation that. Uh, high school kids don't really know, gee, we have Canadians that are drinking drinking water from the lake. I would say most adults in our area don't know that. But one thing we've been working with with youth is to really emphasize with them that we have an international border that we're living on 
and that we, we have our Canadian neighbors, and our Canadian neighbors do drink the water from the lake. So that's, that's something we really want to emphasize with the kids. Uh, we've been working mostly with third graders for the last few years, probably about five years now, except for the COVID year, where we would meet with third graders from Friday Beach. We invite any of the third graders at the local schools in our watershed to come and spend a day learning about what is a watershed. We learn about the four rivers that feed into the watershed in Lymph um, We've also been emphasizing recently the riparian zone and historically how Vermont has used uh, how they used the riparian zone around the rivers in the last couple centuries, but also now what we can do to restore uh, what we've done to the riparian zone. So we've been real happy about some of the activities we've come up with the kids. We're also uh, just now re reaching out with uh, the Rubenstein Institute in Vermont with the Echo, or in Burlington, I should say. Vermont, why does Burlington seem like it's different than, than this part of the world, I think. But anyhow, uh, we reach out to Burlington there, Burlington, Vermont, and Rubenstein Institute, and they've really been helping us with coming up with ideas of how we can use the boat, where you're sitting right out here, uh, for research with using the, and we really intend to, actually we're gonna meet some, uh, September 15th we're doing our first uh, ride with students from Coventry and seeing how we can use the boat. Mayor Pat. Oh, <laughs> I thought you <laughs> Okay, um, great. Okay, and of course we have our river paddles, our nature hikes, uh, workshops that we have going on. Our last uh, general membership meeting, we, we talked about, uh, well, we're, the one coming up, we're gonna be talking about PFAS, we're asking people to come talk on our panel about the PFAS. Uh, let's see, I think we probably should go on to, oh, I should mention we do offer scholarships to, to our local high school kids that are pursuing int uh, an interest in, uh, in the water quality. And again, here we got the water quality. We, that's another part of our emphasis is monitoring cyanobacteria. Uh, as I mentioned, Chuck Golding is one of our lady monitors, and we've done river cleanups. We can move on. Uh, I think to, to wrap up, I just want to leave you with these three statements right here. Uh, one, the MWA supports the current HA moratorium at the Newport uh, at the wastewater treatment plant and will continue to follow the evolving leaching technology and provide the community with information. NWA encourages the state of Vermont to explore the siting of a new landfill outside of the Memphis Mega watershed starting now, since the permitting of a new landfill is a long and arduous process. NWA encourages each individual to take personal responsibility for the generation of waste in their households. Education and outreach regarding waste reduction can be carried out on many different levels but each one of us can make an effort to reduce and use and follow other waste reduction, the guidance given from the state. So if we could leave you with those three statements, uh, I'll we'll turn it back to the panel. in the program, we have one more speaker. It's um, Mr. Gilles Belanger, who's a member of Parliament uh, in Quebec from Orford. Um, so I'm going to try to finagle this so that Gilles is on the screen. Uh, Gilles, are you with us? Yes, thank you, Oliver. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. We can't see you. What I'm going to do is I'm going to mute. I'm going to mute everyone. You can't see me?
define where I have dinner and lunch in Newport, or by boat, or even tour the lake with my road bike, it's really missing. And I hope in soon we'll be able to spend time, I'll be able to spend time with my friends and family in Newport. It's, it's a great pleasure to join you this evening as a delegate of the TAM, the Concertation des Élus to Lac Menfrimata, representing municipal, provincial, and federal representatives from Menfrimata and Sherbrooke area. Lake Menfrimata has been, over the last two decades, subject of a great collaboration between Vermont and Quebec. The steering committee is a well-established work space to support this collaboration. Whereas Lake Mentrenego is a natural treasure and a source of drinking water for almost 200,000 citizens in the Township. It is with deep interest and concern that politicians gather to discuss surface and drinking water protection. On March 19, 2021, we adopted a joint statement to reiterate our common goal. Protection of Lake Mentenegro is a priority shared by all elected officials at all levels of government. Moreover, a motion, like my, my friend Rahab and Mosef, had been adopted in May by National Assembly of Quebec. We were pleased this morning in our local media the ANR extended the ANR extended the ban until 2026. It's a good news. It is well known as scientifically demonstrated that the presence of contaminants such as PFAS in landfill leaching poses risk to human and environmental health. The reject of a treated leaching in Lake Mentrimetra will always remain a source of concern for us. In the past, Quebec population concern have been heard and considered by ANR and by Environmental Commission Act 250, and we recognize this collaboration. We respect the statement that any request to modify this restriction would need to be supported by science new technologies and new data that demonstrate the absence of undue risk of the quality of drinking water from a Menfrenega village. Considering the impact on several hundreds of thousands of Canadians and their next generation, the standard we set for scientific certainly is very, very high. Until then, our position remained to ban leachate treatment in the Lake Mentrenego watershed. I'd like to take a minute to highlight Trump and MCI volunteer. I remember them several years ago in, in the Coventry, and uh, I talked with Rabat Benoit a lot, and I'd like to salute your hard work for the past three years. We look forward to continue our collaboration between Quebec and Vermont. It's very important for us. And we remain committed to protecting the environment and the water quality of Lake Mentrenega. Thank you very much. First on the list is John Barrows. And I think if you, would you like to come up to the microphone, please? Two minutes. Yep, and I'm gonna set a timer for two minutes just because there are um, quite a few, at least 20 speakers. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is John Barrows, and I'm here like everybody else today to help restore the lake. Uh, we have some terrific news from Mr. Peter Laplan earlier today a real victory for Lake Menfermagog 
and that is the extension of the moratorium of leachate being poured into Lake Mentamega. Um, I'd like to direct most of my remarks, since I only got two minutes, about leachate. What are the environmental benefits of dumping leachate into Lake Mentamega? I've done some research, I can't find any. I think if we want to restore the lake, we don't take leachate, which is garbage juice, which has PFAS and many, many, many other contaminants in it, and put it into the lake, which is the drinking water for 175,000 Quebecers. The plan, uh, I want to do thank the state of Vermont and the Agency of Natural Resources for acknowledging the problem of leachate and extending the moratorium. I think that's very important. I think the pilot project is a step in the right direction. But the pilot project doesn't solve the problem. The pilot project will take out four or five known PFAS. It will, will not take out the hundreds of other PFAS, and it will not take out all the other contaminants that is in this leachate, this, this garbage juice, this millions of, of gallons a year that's produced by the, the Coventry Casella landfill. We have a problem on the lake. We're not sure where it came from, but the fish are sick. The fish have cancer. We don't know quite what, if it's, it's from contamination. We don't know exactly where it's coming from because there's multiple sources. But the solution is not to pour more contaminants into the lake. The solution is, it, is, it, is, is to figure out, figure out what's causing the cancer and, 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 and stop that pollution. It may be a, a major cleanup. So, so I'll finish with a question you can answer later if you want. What are the environmental benefits of dumping leachate into Lake Mentamega? Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, next on the list is, is Effie Brown. And if folks have a, just a question that they would like to put to one of the experts, you're welcome to stay in your seat and we can direct it to the panel. Um, and if you would like to make a statement, it would be great if you'd come up to the microphone, particularly since that's will allow it to be broadcast to our folks participating remotely. Effie? I'm back here. I think you can hear me okay. Uh, thank you. Are, are you going to make a statement, though, or do you have a question? I, I'd like to make a statement. Uh, then it would be great if you'd come up to the microphone, just because otherwise the remote participants won't be able to hear you. Thank you. You're welcome. You from the Agency of Natural Resources, and more specifically, from the Department of Environmental Conservation, According to Webster's Dictionary, the definition of conservation is the protection of natural resources. I ask you to do your job and protect our lake. That means add nothing, no leachate or any other impurities ever. Thank you. Next on the list is Peggy Stevens. say yes. <clears throat> I want to know if the ANR and the DEC are open to considering um, looking at reducing the safe drinking water standard for PFAS, which is at this point 20 parts per trillion for five PFAS chemicals. And I want to say I know that Vermont has the strictest standard for PFAS right now in the nation. And that's great. But that was developed a long time ago, and a lot more has been learned about PFAS now. The thousands, thousands of, of chemicals of PFAS. So the fact that we're addressing five in our drinking water standards is really a, a drop in the bucket. So I guess it's my question. As more and more scientific research uh, becomes known, and, in, and, and uh, Robert mentioned uh, Philippe Grangin from Harvard, he's a scientific researcher, and Linda Birnbaum from the uh, National Institutes of Environmental Health, both say 
one part per trillion should be the safest standard for PFAS in drinking water. Given that it is ubiquitous in the environment, we are exposed in many other ways, not just via drinking water. Um, the fact that 22 parts per trillion of PFAS were identified in leachate, I mean, I'm sorry, in the effluent from Newport's wastewater treatment facility recently, um, that's without considering that um, leachate hasn't been disposed of in almost two years since 2019, October. So that's the background PFAS that's entering our wastewater treatment facility right now. I have copies of our dump response plan to protect Lake Memphremega. We are looking at all of the different point sources of contamination, including PFAS, but not limited. There are hundreds of others of chemicals that are uh, toxic to our genes. They, they do weird things to our hormones. Um, and of course, cause cancer. So, um, I, I, sorry, got the point. <laughs> there are copies of this response. Next, we're going to take a, a statement from one of our remote participants. Emma. Emma. So, from. From the group on the uh, virtual meeting, there's a person named Emma who asked if she could make a statement or ask a question. So Emma, the floor is yours if you're still with us. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is actually Sean. Um, we're just using my friend Emma's um, microphone. <laughs> <laughs> um, I really want to thank everybody for being here, for asking the questions um, and representing their respective groups. I'm new to Newport, I'm new to the international border, um, and I, I just didn't hear clearly in the presentation, and was wondering if anybody would be willing to answer the question if it is safe or not to drink the lake water, um, well, the tap water, the lake water in Newport. We're, I'm new to Newport, um, I, I, I'm gathering Newport doesn't collect its drinking water from the lake, but in general, it, it, the, the, both the city water in Newport and the lake water, are they safe to drink based off of um, the PFAS and what we're discussing here? Sure, I, I can uh, give you a, a very high level answer and we can follow up with additional information. Um, but all public water supplies in the state of Vermont are regulated under the Safe Drinking Water Act. Um, and required to, to submit periodic monitoring to the Agency of Natural Resources. All of that data is available through our website, um, and we can, can make sure that, that that link is provided to you. I don't know, if, I'm not sure if there's anyone else on the panel more qualified to answer. There's a groundwater source that they're from well. Okay, thank you. So the, it is a groundwater source that serves the city of Newport. Um, as opposed to a, a surface water supply, so it, it's being drawn from groundwater here, but still subject to the same requirements um, of the agency. All right, uh, we will move on down the list. The next uh, person who requested to speak is Harris Gerson. Wait, I know about your name. Some of you may not. Um, those of you who know me uh, recognize me as the guy with the dog outside or the boat <laughs> that's sitting out there for the last 30 years. Um, I've been coming up here uh, to this lake region for about 30 years. Uh, I'm an out of stater. Uh, I've lived in New York uh, all of my life, but I found this community to be my second home. Um, I'm probably pretty close to moving on um, because I'm expecting to expand my family, expecting a grandchild uh, uh, in uh, September. But I hope to be able to come back here someday soon with my grandchild to show them the beautiful place that I remember as clean and beautiful and pristine. So why am I here right now? Well, I sat through your meeting, 
because I think it was important for me to make a statement as somebody that's been an outsider for 30 years. Um, I came here by accident, literally by accident, falling at Jay Peak and breaking my shoulder <laughs> and discovering this lake. Otherwise, I never would have known about it. But once I discovered it, I found that it had a magic and its people were magical as well. Interesting people, fascinating, family-oriented, good people. Beyond that, I have a background that has never been utilized here, and most people don't even know about it. I am a professor of international management and environmental management, so what's going on here tonight is particularly interesting to me. I directed an international MBA in graduate study program in New York City for close to 10 years, in which I educated uh, probably 1,500 to 2,000 MBA students and graduate students uh, in environmental sciences and international management. That's about time. Yeah. So what we did was we found that if you could find a group of people that were really interested and passionate about something, they would change uh, for the better. And our program evolved around sustainability and environmental uh, sciences from a finance program. And what I'm suggesting here is that if you let the academic communities that surround this city, McGill University, Sherbrooke, the Canadian universities, the uh, University of Vermont, all get involved and let the youth help lead this initiative, you will see change in a positive way because the youth will become the leaders and will take ownership as stakeholders in this process. So I'm willing to hang out a little bit longer to help you do that and help bring the academic communities into this whole uh, process if you're willing to accept me. Thank you. Uh, Jim Campbell. I didn't come here tonight intending to say a word, but um, to follow you, Harrison, is easy because I'm a local yoke with no MBA. Uh, but the, the few talking points I want to make especially this, this group right here, is I'm born and raised here 68 and a half years, and I've fished this lake, I've swam this lake, and we bought property in 1952, 115 acres with a half a mile of lake frontage for $7,500. So uh, the reason I'm here tonight is I've, I've, I've really observed the lake. I've had a boat on this lake since um, on, uh, for 56 years. And I'm concerned about what's going on here. They're talking about this lead chain. I, I don't know, I'm not a scientist, but I'm very passionate about Lake Murphy Magog, and what I've seen, um, and mostly with the weed growth, and it starts many years ago, about 40 years ago, I was sitting in a forum up here at the municipal building, and they were talking about expanding the sewage treatment plant, which they did. And I asked the engineers on site that night, I said, well, you know, I'm really starting to see some weed growth following the current up the lake. And there wasn't anybody on that, on that uh, board that night that could explain it to me. But what I've noticed over the years, it's continued and continued and continued, and it's right where the current goes. So I have some real concerns about that, and, and to do anything more with that sewage treatment plant, I think it'd be a huge mistake um, for the lake. Um, I'm also a little bit passionate because our home farm on the airport road is part of what is now Casella. And what puzzles me is how we ever let one company control the waste for the entire state of Vermont. I just can't get that through my head. I'm mean, not that smart. <laughs> I'm, struggling. I'm really struggling. And I can tell you there was, there, was, there was supposed to be a landfill, I think it was in Williston. And I give credit to the politicians in the Chittenden County area because they were able to stop it. They didn't have a problem sending their waste up here to the Northeast Kingdom along with the prison and other things. But we're not the dumping grounds for the state of Vermont and we've got to stop allowing it to happen. So if, if Casella wants to get rid of this leachate, let him take it to Chittenden County. Today I came back from Johnson, I met six trucks with NBI on the front. NBI is them hauling trash from all over the state of Vermont. 
It's not right. We have to stop it. That's a crown jewel. Take a peek at it. There's not a nicer place in the state. Stop this crap and quit polluting this lake. Natural resources should be involved in landfill siting um, beyond just the permit process. I think the agency should be part of the planning process. Uh, it's, an, it's too important to be left to private industry mm -hmm. to uh, determine where where uh, uh, the solid waste will be uh, deposited in the state. Um, I support the extension of the moratorium. I'm glad that happened. Um, I'm skeptical of the plan to allow Casella to pre-treat leachate uh, unless uh, there is a robust monitoring regime uh, put in place by ANR uh, to remove all contaminants from that leachate. I think the moratorium should be extended until proven and regularly monitored pre-treatment system to remove all contaminants is put in place. And um, I would also just like to say, I've, for a few years now, I've had the privilege of keeping a sailboat on this lake. And um, it is a wonderful place. And uh, it really needs to be protected. Thank you. Take our next question from a virtual participant. So, um, a participant named Marguerite Edelman asked, "How can we get a copy of the per first PFAS survey uh, from Lake Mpumagog that ANR and Kojesaf in Quebec conducted on July 21st?" Um, we've made that document available to MCI, MWA, uh, Dump, and, and others through email. What I can probably do is post that uh, preliminary report to the Vermont DEC website. Um, we'll, we'll put it on. Um, we'll either put the document or a link to it on the um, Vermont DEC Lakes and Ponds website, um, hopefully by you know, tomorrow at some point. So if you're interested in seeing the, the Rick Leedy earlier presented some of the findings from that preliminary PFAS survey from the July sampling event, That'll be at, hopefully by the end of the day tomorrow on the Vermont DC Lakes and Ponds website. We just add that, as Rick said, that's preliminary. We've done the second round of sampling last Friday. Those data should be available, you know, in, in around two weeks from today. There'll be a third round in September, and you know, sometime in October or November, we'll release a comprehensive report uh, describing the results of the three rounds of PFAS sampling in both lake water, tributaries, fish tissue, and effluent. We can go back to the. Um, there's only there's probably a handful of questions in the chat, so maybe every third or fourth uh, speaker in here will we'll grab one from the chat. Uh, next on the list is Pat Segui. Uh, uh, mostly, I wanted to um, uh, raise a comparison. Some years ago, you may remember that. The Cabot indirect discharge permit came up for review, and a lot of people had concerns. There were a lot of water issues, and a proposal was made at that time to uh, involve a stakeholder group that worked with Cabot, that jointly together the stakeholders and uh, Cabot uh, selected the labs that did the water quality monitoring. It was an incredibly transparent process, and I believe Cabot learned a lot about a different way of approaching issues that are very contentious because the water belongs to everybody. It doesn't belong to this business or that business. And I don't know if it was groundbreaking, but I know that, you, and you were involved, it was, it, everybody learned a lot. And so I don't know if the pilot project or something in part of the permitting process, but to bring more transparency to, to this process and to involve, there's a number of groups here that could provide a stakeholder 
uh, person, but we need more transparency in this process. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Charlie Pronto? All right, well, keeping me to two minutes is a problem. <laughs> anybody that knows me. But, um, quickly, background, most everybody knows me. I was mayor of Newport 30 years ago. Um, at that time was my first introduction to landfill liners, which I fought. Um, I'm on record at the, your department uh, at that point, uh, arguing that the EPA says all liners leak eventually. And I said, why the hell are we putting liners on the <clears throat> edge of Lake Metromega? And they said, well, we'll have it figured out in 20 years. Well, it's 30 years later, and if you Google, do all liners leak, EPA, it'll tell you for, 19, for 2021, the answer is yes, they do, eventually. They might not leak today, they may not leak tomorrow, but eventually they're gonna leak. So, unfortunately, um, we have a whole bunch of liners over there, and we keep piling garbage on higher and higher. Last year, um, or two years ago, when I was part of the dump uh, lawsuit against the state of Vermont, um, we were trying to, we talked about the height. They allowed another 10 years and 100 feet higher. And, but every time I drive down Pleasant Street extension of the Glen Road, my stomach does a flip-flop, makes me sick. That's what we're looking at. So there's nothing we can do about that because we're, we're, we're stuck with it for another 10 years. But there's two things that I want to mention about what's happening tonight. The PFAS study, although I'm happy that you're doing it, it appears that dipping a bucket into the surface water is not probably a, a real adequate way to find out where the PFOAs are going. Some of them sink. They should be testing the sediment. They should be testing the further end of the lake because that's where the rivers run all the way through. That's my understanding. You stopped basically at the point. So um, I think you should go a little deeper. Pardon? That's tight. So if you could just wrap your remarks up. Oh, uh, well, okay. Well, <laughs> two other things. Um, <laughs> I just can't do it in two minutes. So um, I, I and Secondly, they said that they put one by the sewer treatment plant. Well, guess what? We're not we're not putting leachate through a sewer treatment plant anymore. So, so, so that that doesn't matter either. Um, and the other thing is, is a pre-treatment facility. I think the leachate ought to be pre-treated. I'm 100% on board with that. But we are, as Mr. Campbell said, and a few others, we're the dumping ground. How about we do this somewhere else? How about we take the leachate out of here and everywhere else? and put it in Chittenden County, or would you consider that the pre-treatment plant or the pre-treatment facility not be in Orleans County? We're sick of it, we're done. We don't need any more of this crap. In my lifetime, I hope that I can be celebrating the last time that you give a permit to the dump. 10 years from now, I hope you're saying no, and I hope you're doing your job now to find another place to put this, because we're done with it, we're sick of it. that's being done to um, test the water. My question is, are we gonna be doing an atmospheric test? Because a lot of studies out in the Midwest and throughout the country have said that PFAS and PFOS falls when it rains, when it snows. I've seen numerous studies over the last month that I've been reading about. And so I'm just curious if our friends to the north, uh, the scientists up there and with the a and R, if you're gonna be doing atmospheric tests also. Um, I don't believe it's part of the current. It's not part of the current. I think it should be because 
with what I've been reading, it's really prevalent in the atmosphere, and that's one thing. Also, um, when it comes to testing for PFAS and PFOS and all that, have you identified uh, um, septic systems all along the lake that could potentially be putting PFAS into the lake? Because we all know that everything we use, um, women's mascara to other things in the house, have PFAS and PFAS. And if, and if our wastewater treatment plant is being singled out of not being scientifically able to treat it, I think we should be testing all the land, not land landfills, the um, septic systems along the entire lake. I think that's a very important thing to be testing. Um, I, I love the lake. I've grown up in Newport. I'm all for the lake and protecting it. Um, and I guess my final thing is on the fish. Have you done the history of the railroad? of what was dumped in South Bay. And my father worked on the railroad and he told me stories of what they used to, the train would go by and they would just throw the broken kerosene lanterns in the lake and other things. So I'm just wondering if that's maybe attributing to some of the issues with the fish. And so that's all I had to say with more questions than answers. And I appreciate it, thank you. And just to respond to the question you asked about septic systems, we don't, we're not specifically sampling septic systems as part of the work that's ongoing here. That said, we've done a, a broader statewide assessment looking at um, a variety of different sources of, of potential PFAS contamination, um, including some sampling of septage to get a, an idea as to, to what may be in those. Um, and that is available on the watershed management website as well of the Department of Environmental Conservation. Pete, did you want to answer the question about fish? Yep. Um, Maybe come up to the microphone just so folks can hear you at home. And then I'll over the next question. So Paul, yes, we, um, we are aware of what was going on in South Bay with the railroad. Um, our preliminary study, which was looking at the 60 analytes as recommended by the EPA, included um, a, a deeper dive into what was going on, uh, which resulted in a mitigation of sediments that were taken out of South Bay uh, in 2000, um, where they removed a lot of the contamination that was done uh, by the railroad for over 100 years. So yes, we were aware. We actually thought we kind of had the, the cap by the tail with regard to the, the bullhead melanoma, but as it turns out, they do not seem to carry large uh, concentrations of the PAHs that are prevalent in the South Bay. So my understanding from Oliver is that there are a couple of folks who have asked in the chat, I think, uh, reiterating a question that was asked in the room here about uh, the environmental benefit of putting leachate in the lake. Um, and I think we probably could all agree there is no environmental benefit, um, but rather this is an environmental reality. Uh, not that it has to go here, but that it has to go somewhere. I'm confident none of you have gone through your day without throwing something away. And the fact of the matter is we, we need landfills and we need disposal. Um, I, I support the comments that were made by the Memphis Magog Watershed Association about the need to uh, think about ways to, to reduce um, our, our overall waste footprint and to try to reuse and recycle wherever possible. Um, but at the same time, just the, the very process of being, we, we create waste. And it's, a, it's an unfortunate reality, um, but a reality. And so I, I don't want to um, suggest that, that there is an environmental benefit. I don't believe any of you think there is an environmental benefit to disposing of leachate. Um, but the fact of the matter is, leachate is a reflection of our lifestyle, um, and it exists, and we need to look for strategies to treat it, minimize it, and address it. Uh, the next question, or next person who signed up on the list was Pam Letts. Part of what I was going to say actually has just been addressed by you. Uh, my, na my name is Pam Les. I'm a member of DUM. I'm also a member of MWA. Uh, I do the short the VIP patrolling, looking for invasives. My credibility really will depend on which group you ask, <laughs> unfortunately. So technically, I'm owned by all three of you. 
there is no benefit to us up here, other than a financial one, which is why Newport has supported discharging leachate into the lake. That is a really sad reality. And it would be wonderful if we could recognize that people, water, and the environment is significantly more important than money. It's really sad if we're so desperate for money up here that we're willing to take, continue to take leachate. We were apparently really upset as a city when we stopped taking it because it was a financial loss. We pay taxes, we all pay taxes, but it's really time for somewhere else to take the leachate. Montpelier's taking it now. Um, they seem to be quite happy with that arrangement, but maybe that the site that's being talked about really could go to Chittenden County, uh, to the site that you had in Williston that somehow never got finalized, that somehow Williston managed to get rid of it. It somehow just evaporated and everything continued to come back here. Reducing recycling and not wasting is a great idea. It's a wonderful idea. We all should be doing it. However, if we take, if we produce less up here, Casella is a business. I, I'm not criticizing that. That's a reality. They're a business. They will take more from out of state. They're already talking about taking garbage from other states, from Connecticut, from bringing leachate in from Bethlehem. We don't need it. Take it away. conceptual study that uh, Casello got from Brown and Caldwell, but it's conceptual. Um, what I've read, that this is a huge issue for solid waste management in North America. And the EPA is still calling for research, request for proposals to be able to study this situation. So, Secretary Moore, how concerned are you and the state of Vermont about permitting what would be our country's first experiment in trying to date, reduce leachate to, uh, or reduce PFAS. Remove them, that's what we need. And if that's not ready yet, because they are accepting these, the first round of uh, research proposals was due in 2022, and now a new one is, is being set out. It's going to be a while. Why should it take place on the banks of an international so I, I, that's an excellent question. Uh, we put consider PFAS to be in a category of contaminants of emerging concern, and emerging means just with what you're indicating, that, that we don't have complete knowledge yet. Um, we are certainly learning as we go. I think the, the state of Vermont, and frankly New England states in general, are, are well out in front on issues related to these perfluorinated compounds. Um, we've been very aggressive since they were first discovered in Bennington um, in 20, 2015, 2016, um, and working to, to better understand not only what the, the treatment technologies are to address them, what the sources are, um, and what the environmental man management strategies are. Um, and we're committed to continuing to, to do that work. As Pete described in his presentation, um, part of that is going from this conceptual to a pilot scale approach where we can conduct the kind of monitoring we would need to be, be assured that it's achieving the levels of treatment um, that are being reported in sort of the, the trade literature at this point. Um, so this is, there is a significant research component to it, um, but I think that's true of a lot of areas of our work, that they evolve over time based on the best science available to us. Um, and we know what is needed uh, is, is to do better and look at strategies that are able to remove PFAS. They're called forever compounds for a reason. Uh, once they're in the environment, it is very difficult to get rid of them. 
Um, and so we're, we are looking at, at the best available science and the best available strategies for, for capturing them and keeping them from getting into the environment. Thank you. There's any, it, it could be a liability for Vermont, so I'm concerned about all of us. That's right. Understood. No, I would just, I would echo what Julie just said and add that, I mean, it's important that we get after treating these and removing these regardless of where they're discharged. And we feel like we have a very good plan in place that you'll see when you know the, the pilot study and the description of the of the information we're going to gather from the installation of this pilot study to move from the theoretical and, and sort of lab bench scale to a, a fully operational uh, system working here in Vermont across seasons because we, we think just like all of you do and all of you have been expressing tonight it's important to treat and remove these and we want to do that as soon as possible. You know, we, we're, we're not waiting for some of the national level research. We feel like a well-designed study that provides that treatment opportunity here is really important. And if done well and monitored well, we're hopeful that we'll get good results from it. I mean, it's, it's not gonna add any additional PFASs to the leachate already. It's gonna remove them. The question is, how effective will it be? And that's what the study will show us. So we're, we're, we're you know, committed to pushing forward with treating this leachate. We're gonna to go to the, the virtual participants. Yeah, there's a question from Paul Noel and Pete Emerson, just to perk your ears up. Have the bullhead lesions ever been found in other watersheds or on other fish species? Which microphone do I talk into oh. now? Oh. <laughs> um, yes, uh, bullhead lesions um, occur in nature. Um, what our concerns were here with Lake Mofromagog was the uh, the percentage of the bullhead that we were seeing uh, was was unusual. It was high, uh, and so that's why we're investigating that. Uh, other fish lesions, yes, but other fish cancers, not as common. So across the state, you will find fish that do have uh, various markings on them, um, infections, and some of them are are widespread and benign, and others um, like the bullhead here in Lima from Magog are less so. So um, I guess ultimately, you know, fish illnesses are not unique, but this melanoma is. And when I say unique, I don't mean it's like never existed anywhere else on the planet. It's just this pr proportion, this percentage, on what we consider a relatively clean lake, it is, it is somewhat unusual. Martha Sylvester, Sylvester Hall, Vermont. Everybody. Um, I first of all like to say thank you everybody for showing up. Um, it's really good to see everyone showing up. I have a couple of statements and then a couple of questions. First of all, I'd just like to acknowledge that I spent 20 minutes with my town administrator today to try to look for the information for this meeting and he did not have it so it's disappointing that the town of Coventry couldn't inform their citizens of this meeting. And Second, secondly, I'd like to um, read that the, the Vermont Department of Environmental Conservation's mission is to preserve, enhance, restore, and conserve Vermont's natural resources and protect human health for the benefit of this and the future generations. I want to state how highly disappointed I am in Secretary Moore for not acknowledging our lake is in crisis. I have been catching fish with my children and now my grandson with tumors on it for years. If that is not an issue, then what are we even doing here? You, your very job is to present and preserve. I don't see that happening. So I find that very disturbing and very disappointing. Going, going down, I also um, have a couple of questions. First of all, who actually manages and runs the state of Vermont's recycling program. Is it our solid waste 
division is responsible for overseeing the implementation of our universal recycling law. So who actually manages the recycling facilities for our state's recycling? Who operates that? Uh, one is operated by Casella and one is operated by the Chipman Solid Waste District. Thank you. Secondly, um, I would like to also ask, um, has the presented the percentages of the lesions and tumors in the fish risen more than 30% since 2012? No, they've been pretty consistent. So we're still 30%? Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. <coughs> uh, and just in, in brief, um, in regards to the lake and crisis designation, uh, appreciating that, that it, um, that description um, certainly is, is open to, to a, lar a variety of, of interpretation. The specific statutory authority given to me as the Secretary of Natural Resources is very limited and narrow, and it requires, um, among other things, a documented reduction in property values, and that simply doesn't exist here. So it's, I don't have discretion. Um, there is a, a three-part statutory test, and the Lake, Lake Memphremagog didn't meet that test. Uh, Ann Chiarello. Hello. I live here in Newport. I chose to move to Vermont 13 years ago. New Hampshire was an option, but I chose Vermont. Recently, I must say, um, I have to compliment New Hampshire on being smart enough to say, we don't want the leachate here in Bethlehem, New Hampshire uh, anymore. Um, and I don't know why. <laughs> when we, we think leachate's problematic and PFOAs are in it, uh, and that it's hard to get rid of it once you've got it, Vermont somehow agreed that Casella is able to take all of that leachate and process it here. Now, it's great that we have a moratorium that will last maybe another six years not to take it in our Newport plant, but it's going somewhere else in Vermont. And I would only ask us to be as wise as the New Hampshire people have been recently in saying, no more leachate here. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Teresa Gray. treatment of leachate, and I'm going to turn this over to Pete or maybe Casey uh, Captain, who's on the line to help answer, but in looking at the pilot, um, how are we going to identify the pollutants of concern and what happens um, if we are unable to successfully remove them to levels that are not injurious to public health, correct? And over five years, the list may grow. Sure. And over time, with a concern that over time, the list of pollutants may grow. Thanks, Julian. So the, the part of the pilot study is going to be characterization of exactly what is in the leachate. So that's going to be part of the study. Um, and so first, the, you know, doing the testing, doing the testing of the various compounds in the leachate, and then evaluation of the pilot technology that's chosen. Different technologies perform differently on different pollutants. So depending on the final technology that's chosen in, as, as actually pilot, then how is that performing across these different pollutants? So that's, that's going to be some of the work that's done in that pilot study. So some, 
you know, the, the pollutant of most concern that we're focused on are the PFOSs. So there are certain technologies that are better at PFOSs than other pollutants, but you know, what are those, what are the various components of the leachate, and then how are those reduced across the, the technology that is in fact piloted? That's going to be the result, one of the results of the pilot study. There, there are different scans you can do. Like right now, we one of the scans for PFAS is, for example, the work that we did out in the lake, the sampling in the lake. There's a particular scan for PFAS that gives you back 36 different analytes. So 30, so we're looking at 36. Even though we regulate five, we're testing for 36. There are different other prior, so-called priority pollutant scans that give you back information on a number of different compounds. So I mean, I guess. That's the best way I can answer your question. Plan B. I'm sorry. Part of our question was what was Plan B. What do you mean? What was Plan B? And your pre-treatment facility that we're looking at won't take care of the contaminants. Well, I mean, that's, I mean, when we get the results of this study back in, that's what we'll do, is we'll review the study, and then we'll decide at that point, is this effective in the pollutants of concern, or do we need to do something different? So, yeah. And I mean, and, and also, there are certain chemicals that are not reduced by typical secondary wastewater treatment. There are certain chemicals that are. So I mean, the, the, the secondary wastewater treatment facility and then the advanced treatment on the tail end of that that removes phosphorus and other chemicals as a result of coagulation, that those will provide some treatment as well. But again, I mean, you know, where this as, as um, the lady that spoke a few moments ago mentioned, this is, you know, we're, we're out on the leading edge of this. I mean, there are landfills across the country and they all are afflicted with this same problem and we're taking these steps forward to provide you know, to do this study and to learn more about it. As Secretary Moore mentioned a few minutes ago, these are chemicals of emerging concern, so we're learning. But where we feel like we've got a well-designed pilot study, you'll be able to take a look at it when that pre-treatment permit comes out for public review. We welcome your comments on it, but there are unknowns. I mean, that's, that we're learning, and that's the purpose of the pilot. But again, we feel like it's important to start doing this work rather than waiting and continuing to discharge. Don McDowell. Yeah. Hello, folks. Um, I got to put these on. Sorry. <laughs> I have um, I've been quite familiar with Lake Mefromagog for a long time. My parents brought me here when I was about ten years old, and since then I've been I've you know visited it many times. I've worked on the lake, I've played a lot on the lake, and starting uh, five years ago, my wife and I bought a property on the side of the lake. So I clearly have some, some interest in this lake. I'm trained as a stream ecologist, a water biologist. I've done a lot of research with water chemistry, in particular with phosphates. And I've been educating people in ecology and environmental science for my entire career. And given that, I'm, I, I guess I have a couple of questions for, for the people that are visiting us tonight, and that is, would you adopt, as the speaker from Dump said earlier tonight, adopt the precautionary principle? Are we really surprised that we put a dump on the side of Lake Memphremagon and that we have a problem. Of course we have a problem. We're taking, thank you, Jim. We're taking garbage from northern Vermont, central Vermont, I'm not sure exactly how far south it goes. And we're putting it in one landfill in Coventry. And a gentleman earlier suggested it's been 20 years. I, I didn't do the research before I got here for decades, are we surprised we have a problem? And is the problem going to get worse? Of course it's going to get worse. You can't take all this material and put it on the side of a large body of water and not expect it to get worse. 
Now, given that, I'm surprised if, if I miss this, I, I miss this, but will you consider closing the dump? As Secretary of the Agency of Natural Resources, as members of DEC, I would say you have a lot of pull, that you have a lot of weight. I know it, I, I was shocked when it was approved for another 10 years. I just couldn't believe it. Like, how long does Member Magog have to pay the cost? It's been 20 years of dumping garbage here. When is enough is enough? And I think enough was years ago. Amen. I agree it should go somewhere else. Vermonters will continue to produce garbage, but we don't need to take all their garbage. Men from Magog doesn't need to take all their garbage. It can go somewhere else. This is because this is a political issue. It's not a scientific issue. I've looked at the data up here. Yeah, the phosphates concern me. The clarity concerns me. I'll tell you what really concerns me is all the other things that are coming out of this dump that we're not studying right now that are going into the lake. The last thing I would say is. And I'll just throw this out here for our Canadian friends. What if it was reversed? What if Magog had a huge dump, owned 25% of the surface area of the lake, and we owned 75% of it, and all that material was coming our way? What if it flowed south? We haven't talked about that. I think we would be, I, I know we'd be having a very different conversation tonight. And I think our concerns would be very different. I think we need to I think we need to put that hat on. I'm sorry I'm going overboard, but I knew I only had one chance here. But, um, I think we need to put that hat on. I think we need to really consider that. And I don't think we have. Thank you. Yes, I saw that um, a participant named Lisette Maillet had her hand raised. Um, Lisette, uh, if you want to unmute yourself and make a comment, please go ahead. You're still muted though, so just be sure to un click that unmute button. Thank you. Um, I was wondering that uh, Mr. Lefranc's uh, previous comment, where he said that we're piloting this project in, uh, in Vermont, um, I was wondering, and, and in the same uh, phrase, he said that there was garbage dumps all over the states and we had to address the issue. I was wondering if there are other um, states that are doing pilot projects as well, and if they are focusing on the same type of technology and the same type of uh, contaminants. Just so we can see best practices. Thank you. Thank you for the question, Lizette. Um, there are a few. Um, there, it's not uh, the, the re one of the reports that are that's up on our website is the so-called Brown and Caldwell report, and then there is a secondary report after that that actually reviewed the Brown and Caldwell report. A different consultant that provides some background on the, the you know the existing situation and some of the existing technologies out there. There are a few, but not a lot. Um, again, I think we're we're on the certainly. Nationally, we're on the leading edge of this. Um, so th there is some work being done on this. There's a lot of interest in this, of course, because these concerns are not unique here. You know, there's, as you are aware, there's, there's global concern around the PFOSs, and certainly here in the United States, and in Quebec and the rest of Canada as well. There are two places where there is a lot of this concern. So, and unfortunately, as Secretary Moore was saying, you know, the, the accumulation of everything that we throw away, a lot of which does contain PFOSs or did contain PFOSs, um, winds up in landfills and then therefore winds up in leachates. So, I mean, it's, a, it's an emerging problem, both in terms of our understanding of these chemicals and our understanding of the sources of them. So, um, to not go on, there, there is some work being done on it, but not a lot. Oliver, are there other questions from rural participants? There is one more. Okay. Just the last question uh, from someone named Walter Medwid. Starts with a comment. We no longer allow compost to enter the waste stream. We recycle bottles and cans to avoid them getting into the waste stream. We recycle metals to avoid entering the waste stream. And we recycle electronics to avoid their getting into the waste stream. The question, why doesn't A&R 
take a strong position to stop all leachate forever as policy today. So whereas each of the, the products or um, components, constituents of our waste stream mentioned there are able to be pulled off of the waste stream, uh, the leachate is generated by virtue of the things that we still throw away. Um, and the fact that there is a working and open face of a landfill that is, is open to the weather, um, as well as the materials that we have thrown away break down over time. Um, so unlike metals or plastics or compost, where there are ways to, to sort of pull that off, um, the leachate is a residual of what's left behind. And that's why reducing our waste streams is so important. Anything we do to reduce the volume of material being sent to the landfill is in service of reducing leachate. Um, but it's not something that can be eliminated as long as we're throwing things away. I, there were no other people signed. Oh, would you like? I'm sorry. Please. Try to keep it to two minutes. So my name is Sue. I'm actually a recent um, property owner here, and my brother-in-law lives up the street. And so I live in Idaho. But I thought of three things: biology. If you all were fish, two of you would have huge cancerous lesions on you. So think of that. That's major. Economics. That landfill makes this area a lot of money. And the reason it's cited here is because of environmental justice. There's a reason why it's in this part of the world. Thirdly, that's related to politics. I just came, my sister lives in Addison County which is next door to Chittenden County, and I was just in Lake Champlain yesterday. If this was going on in Lake Champlain, there would be 50 times as many people here, and we wouldn't be getting, oh, it's because of, we're throwing away too much waste, or, oh, it's because we're not recycling enough. There would be a lot more going on here. So I'm new to this area. I'm not living here yet. But I totally see the economics of it and the politics of it are really what's going on here. Hi, thanks. I wasn't planning on speaking either, but I have a couple questions. A lot of them were answered very short, so I'll have to be on my toes. Christina Cottmore, I am a Derby resident my entire life. Thank you so much for coming to do this. We are often um, can feel like we are the forgotten cousins, out of sight, out of mind. So thank you, we sincerely appreciate the time that you have taken today. I have a question specifically for Pete Emerson, but then I'd like to have a question for all of you. I think it might be a good one to end the program. Um, the fish, the lesions. Um, what are your next steps, I didn't hear that, in trying to identify, and you, you use the word unique, and I hope you you're considering that the unique thing about this lake, other than its beauty, is that we are one of, I believe, the only lake in Vermont that has received thousands of gallons of leachate um, just a few hundred yards from the lake. So maybe that's the unique part that's creating the unique lesions on the fish. So I'd love to hear what your next steps are. Um, and also, you have a lot of people that are passionate about the lake, water. Water is our most precious resource, um, and we are all passionate about that. I mean, water is life. Um, what can we do for you? What can we do to help? These are people energized, excited, passionate about it, and we want to help. Thank you. Thank you. That was Christine? Yes. Thanks. Um, also, can we find your, your results? On the yep. somewhere. Um, so I, we can, we are providing sites, and some of these investigations are ongoing, so it's kind of hard to provide like okay. terminal results, but we are we are providing um, some reports, and, and one of them was the Vicki Blazer report, and we have Vicki back on board from the USGS, and so I can speak, I'm really glad you ended this way, because I did want to talk about this, and I felt like I missed my opportunity. Um, I said we're working with UVM, 
we're looking at taking the bullhead genome and mapping it fully. That's one thing that we're proposing that we do, and I think we're gonna get funding for this, and we're excited to work with UVM to have them map the genome. Once you map the genome, you can start looking at the, the genetics, and once we know which genes are being kind of hit, we can try to understand why those genes are being hit. Um, and so that's a, way over my head. I don't do cancer research. <laughs> So we're working with cancer researchers. We're working with the USGS because they are fish health specialists. And we have some fish health biologists here, but they don't specialize in this kind of thing. So we're not trying to solve our problems internally. We're partnering. And these people are excited because they look at this as something unique. Um, believe me, there are worse places from contaminant perspectives that have bullhead than Lake Humphrey Maybach. So we're not saying this is a contaminant related issue specifically. We don't necessarily believe that at all. And we're looking at a lot of things, including viruses that cause cancer. Um, so we're, we're looking at the big picture now, not just pinpointing it on one thing. We're including the PF, AS, PFOS investigation and a lot of other contaminants when we dig into this a little deeper, once the money arrives. So we're, we're very excited to have the opportunity to actually solve this problem. We think we can. We think it's going to take some time. We have a lot of work to do. What can you do to help us? Well, it's 2012 was the first notice we had. We were looking at the lake pretty regularly. We weren't focused intentionally on just one species. We look at kind of everything. We would have found it, but they found it first. So it was brought to us by anglers. And we aren't up in Lake went from Magog all the way up in, in Magog as often as we'd like to be, but they found it there for us too. So yeah, the people calling and saying we have a problem, we appreciate hearing it because sometimes you're the first to know. Thanks. I was the first one to get a clap. You guys notice that? <laughs> <laughs> I also appreciate your uh, kind of closing question about what you can do. Um, and as I am kicking off the tactical basin planning process, that is a case where we really are looking for community input into the planning process, both around what are some water quality issues out there on the ground that people have concerns about. You know, we have a lot of information about what's going on in the watershed, but a lot of you know your local streams, uh, know your local shoreline, you might have things, or might be aware of things out there on the landscape that we don't know about. So, you know, I'll be sending out some information and getting the word out around the tactical basin planning process, sending out a survey. But as much as uh, people are uh, able to engage in that process um, and help us as a state understand what those issues are around the watershed and also what communities can do to address some of those things. You know, I get a little bit less involved in some of the topics that we've really talked about tonight but the areas around phosphorus pollution really come from hundreds of different sources around the watershed. And it really does take everyone across the watershed to address some of those. Um, yeah, so we'll be letting people know about that process. And again, really appreciate it. People could engage and uh, let us know. I guess I'll just add to Ben's comments. I mean, I think the fact that all of you are here tonight participating is a really good way to help us and to stay involved in this, to comment when we put the draft permit out, to continue to be involved in the, in the processes where we ask for public input and to get involved with your local watershed groups. Um, you know, on both sides of the border, there are active watershed groups. Um, as Oliver mentioned and others have mentioned, we meet a couple, at least a couple times a year with those groups uh, in our International Steering Committee. And your involvement and your interest, both locally with those groups and then reaching out to us as we do things, tactical basin planning, uh, permitting, it's very helpful. So I'd say that really helps us a lot. Uh, so please stay engaged in that way and um, we appreciate you coming out tonight. So. I actually, it, it brought up another question. Did I heard that um, the professor in Sherbrooke at the University of Sherbrooke who's conducting the, the monitoring and the study and, and putting the buoys in the lake is looking for US participants. Do you have any knowledge of that or are you working with them on Our this? Our lake's manager can speak to that. Great. <laughs> sure, I'll, I'll start by addressing that question. So it's Céline Guéguin, 
is the professor at University of Sherbrooke. Um, we've, we've been in touch with her for a couple of years. There was going to be, before COVID, there was going to be uh, this neat effort to put these passive samplers all throughout the lake on both sides of the border, throw them in the lake, retrieve them, and they can tell you a lot about what's happening with lake chemistry and water quality. That was put on hold because of COVID. And I think that that's now been eclipsed by this observatory idea. The buoy that they're putting in costs roughly $25,000. Canadian has some really neat uh, functionality. Uh, but one thing it doesn't have is the ability to look at data in real time. Um, we have a buoy in Lake Carmine, and soon there'll be two in uh, Lake Champlain, which collect different water quality parameters like temperature, dissolved oxygen, pH. You can give you an idea about biological productivity and cyanobacteria bacteria from different types of sensors. And those buoys, you can look at them in real time. You can go onto a website and see exactly what's happening in the lake um, at that time. So if you want to see what that looks like, there's one for Lake Carmine. It's on a UVM EPSCOR, E-P-S-C-O-R site. So I would like to establish something like that in Lake Memphremagog, in US waters, to complement what the Canadians are doing uh, under this new observatory. And we'll, we'll start looking for funding. Uh, Dr. Gigan and I just had this conversation about a week ago. So, you know, it's, it, that costs between thirty dollars and $40,000. We need to find that money, and if we can, we'll put that in place. So, yeah, that's, that's what's going on over there. Just, and to, to your other question, um, how can you get involved? We have volunteers working across the state in three areas. We have lay monitors, so that's Chuck Golding for the main lake. We need a lay monitor starting next year for South Bay. It involves going out eight to ten times a year in your boat to collect different water quality parameters. We put those together to form that lake scorecard I showed earlier. We use that data to make decisions about is the lake impaired, does it need to be restored, or is it a high quality water that needs to be protected to keep it in that state. So that's one area. We need cyanobacteria monitors, people that we train to go out and make regular observations on a weekly basis if there's a bloom or not, blue green algae bloom or not. More of those around the lake would be great. And finally, the Memphremagog Watershed Association folks talked a little bit about Vermont invasive patrollers. Those are folks that help us identify invasive species outbreaks, be it starry stonewort, the Phragmites. You know, and, and uh, President Biden hasn't opened the border yet for Canadians to come into um, the US, but when he does, the zebra mussels are gonna be first in line. They've been detected just north of the border. We've done some net, uh, we've, we've, we've dragged some nets behind boats and we're still checking those samples, but we'll probably have zebra mussels in US waters very soon. So, you know, the Canadians will, will complain about us sending um, leachate their way. They get a little revenge by sending zebra mussels our way. Um, and then, you know, finally, I'm a little hesitant to say this, but, but I am a resident of Chittenden County. Um, right? I'm, very, I'm therefore very interested to, to hear about the results of, of the pilot study um, that, that Casella will be doing with, with A&R and DEC oversight to figure out what the options, the best options are for treating leachate. And I'll tell you why. You know, since the moratorium was put in place for treating of leachate here in Newport, that leachate is primarily going to Montpelier. It goes into the Winooski River and it ends up in Lake Champlain. And so the commenter from Idaho was talking about Champlain. There is concern about this uh, in Lake Champlain. And it's something that we need to figure out as, as a state because it's, it's not going away. Um, and be it Newport, be it Winooski, be it you know, Montpelier, it needs to go somewhere. So having the best options to uh, treat it and pre treat it and keep it as little, keep it as to the extent possible out of our waters is, is what I'm personally interested in, and I, I'm really looking forward to learning more about that study. So I'll, I'll stop my remarks there. Looks like Mindy has a question. I'll write a question again to you about, um, not a question, but a comment. Uh, in the studies we've done in Mountain 2, you know, we have branched out. We have talked with folks in Montpelier. We have talked with a lot of the environmental groups in Burlington. And we were kind of on the leading edge. If you're talking about Vermont being on the leading edge, was talking about this. They were worried about more of the same things that have been happening all along. Um, understand that uh, Montpelier has agreed, you know, basically because they knew they could probably handle it bit better than others. But Burlington and Essex both denied the leachate going to them. So this is so serious. And I'm, I'm concerned, um, Peter, about us being the ones that take the leading edge, be the experimenters, we're the guinea pigs. All that leachate is going to come to Casella, whether it comes into Lake Memphremagog or not, it would come to Casella. 
And that's a dangerous thing right there because I don't believe there is enough monitoring that happens of solid waste. There's so few inspections that go on at the landfill, very few. We had that discussion at the Act 250. And so I think that we really need to work together with other states. And if it turns out that Vermont might have to consider exporting leachate instead of importing it, because that's going to happen. We've already talked about how Bethlehem could be doing that. I think those are the kind of concerns we have. And when we took it out of our hearts to go and talk with the folks in Montpelier and in Burlington and Champlain to say, yeah, it is going into Lake Champlain a little slower and a little later than it has with us. I, I think we need to have, we're very small people here, very small population, and I think that's taken advantage. So we need to have this known throughout the state and be able to expand on that information. I'm going to Thank you, Lydia. It's almost 8 o'clock, so I'm going to see you in Florida, <laughs> Secretary Moore. And I just want to close out by, by thanking you all for, for participating this evening. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to come and share our work and to hear from all of you. Uh, the, we did record the meeting this evening, and both that recording and the PowerPoint presentations will be available on the ANR.gov website. Um, probably later this week. It takes a little bit of time to, to upload files as, as large as this one is due to its length. Um, but thank you, and I encourage you to, as, as Pete said, continue to be involved, to participate in the process, the basin planning process, the commenting on the pretreatment permit. Um, we're grateful for your engagement and your time tonight. Thank you.